Good evening. Welcome to worship. Today we're going to be talking about our happily ever after. And that might seem contradictory when you look at some of our readings with fire and uh, you know, destruction of the end times. But the happily ever after is the promise and is the focus both now and yet to come. We open with our beginning of evening service prayer of life on page 243 with the service of light. Please stand. <coughs>
and reflection. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host and may glorify you forever. Amen. We join together in the additional psalm which is printed in your bulletin on the bottom of page 2. It's Psalm 130. <coughs> Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is the greatness, that there none be fear. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watch before the morning, more than watch before the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. You may be seated as we sing hymn number 508, The Day is Surely Drawing Near, verses 1, 2, 5, and 7.
Good evening. Uh, the first reading will be from the Old Testament reading, um, Ezekiel chapter 37, <coughs> verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. <coughs> it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophecy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come up upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold a rattling, and the bones came together bone to its bone. <coughs> and I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, <coughs> O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commended me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophecy and say to them, <coughs> Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I, am open, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the epistle reading will be 2 Peter's chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by my way of reminder that you should remember that the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoff scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were with the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. <laughs> But do not overlook this, fa this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but His patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. 
and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in your lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and ha hastening the coming of the day of God, because which the heavens <coughs> <coughs> will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Please stand and honor the gospel. Our gospel reading is from St. John chapter 11, verses 17 to 27, and continuing to verses 38 through 44. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Then Jesus deeply moved again and came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. For I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people, told by the prophets. And now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You may be seated as we sing a historic verse from the, Magi, the hymn Amazing Grace, uh, which is printed for you in your bulletin. It's uh, verse 6 from the historic text.
judgment and salvation of God are present and promised happily ever after. I know what you're thinking. These aren't necessarily the happiest start of a verse, but despite the vivid terror of flood and fire that in our text from Peter's day reminds us the ultimate purpose of what Peter is trying to say is trying to get us to remember the predictions of the Holy Prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. 2 Peter 3 verse 2. Because according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, in our epistle text, like our verse from Amazing Grace, Peter, and to the lesser extent, John Newton, remind us of the coming judgment of God. A day when earth will dissolve like snow and the sun will cease to shine. Yet amidst the chaos and destruction, we can find comfort in the knowledge that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be forever ours. In other words, that we will live happily ever after. Now, I know what you're thinking, that happily ever after is far, far away, that the promised new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells seem like just a dream and a wish our heart makes. Like Cinderella saying, the things haven't changed since we came to the faith. They've been like they have for so long. The world just keeps continuing as it always has from the beginning of creation. Where's the engagement? Where's the courting, the romance, the protection promised us by God? If we are the bride of Christ, where's the groom? Why hasn't Christ shown up yet? Climb the castle walls. Sweep us off our feet. Carry us off in style, like little John encourages Robin Hood to do. I don't understand, and I don't know about you, but for the last 2,000 years or so, I haven't seen Christ descend through the clouds to come to a rescue. Instead, I feel like when Christ does finally come back, it will be more likely that we'll look at him and we'll be bewildered and disillusioned, kind of like the words from the beast in Beauty and the Beast. You came back. Because that's exactly what happens to our hearts and our faith when we listen to the lies of the world and forget the promises of God. We lose patience. We lose patience in God's promised return. But despite our lack of faith, God has indeed called us to live happily ever after with him. In the beginning of our epistle, Peter reminds us that we are to remember the words spoken by the prophets and the apostles, as well as the commandments of our Lord and Savior. We are to be diligent in our faith and to remain steadfast in the face of those scoffers and our own sinful selves who deny the truth of God's word. Peter reminds us and those scoffers that in the last days, mocking of the promise of Christ's return will happen. That scoffers will live in unbelief. We will see this same unbelief. And when we see it today, when we see the scoffing today, as many people reject the truth of God's word and deny the existence of our creator, we'll see what it means to live their lives as if there's no judgment to come, focusing only on the pleasure and the pursuit of desires. Peter tells us that they're ignorant 
of the fact that the word was once, or that the world was once destroyed by water, and that the same fate awaits again, but this time by fire. As Christians, we must be attentive to our faith, protecting it by dwelling in God's word and commands, knowing that Christ has not promised freedom from pain and struggle, but quite the opposite, in fact. That instead, Jesus has promised to give us the very strength we need to remain steadfast in the face of opposition, knowing that our Lord and Savior will one day return to judge the living and the dead. We should not be swayed by the mocking of unbelievers, but instead we must cling to the truth of God's Word, even when it's difficult or unpopular, yet even amidst the coming pain and destruction, we can find comfort in the knowledge that our God will be forever ours. John Newton reminds us of this truth again as he writes, The earth shall dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. These words remind us that no matter what happens in the world, our God will never leave us or forsake us. God has called us to live happily ever after with him. John Newton knew the power of God to lead a sinner from a life that was being totally wasted away to be a life that was saved by grace through faith. As John went from a rebellious and stubborn teenager to a young slave ship captain, he not only lived a life of sin, but he actively sought to further inflict misery and pain on his fellow mankind through his very profession. you think having himself survived through slavery, storms, and the ever-looming threat of drowning out at sea, that he would have been quicker to set his sails and his sights towards God's promised new heavens and new earth. But instead, it took the very disease of original sin itself, manifested through his body being broken by a severe seizure, that he finally started to live out the faith that for so long he'd only nominally proclaimed and professed. When John Newton finally came to write the words to our song, Amazing Grace, he did so to stir up in our sincere minds by way of reminder that we should remember the prediction of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through our modern day apostles. And just like Peter wrote to the church of his day to remind us that God has called us to live happily ever after with him, so also when John Newton started living the faith, the words that he put into the song Amazing Grace were to stir our hearts, to remind us of the happily ever after promised by God. <coughs> yes, you are right. It might seem like our happily ever after isn't really right now, but it's exactly what God has promised us that we would go through turmoil and misery, and as the end approached, things would get more difficult, not easier. Yet, despite it all, we would be secure. We would be secure in our hope. We would recognize and see the power of God's promises being fulfilled all around us. We and our faith in Him seriously. Don't lose patience in God's promised return. As Peter points out, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. 
2 Peter 3, verse 9. That way is we patiently await God's promised return. We won't be surprised like an inattentive homeowner who leaves his faith open to be stolen away by the father of lies in the world. Instead, we will be ready and waiting, protecting our faith until the day Christ returns, when the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming day of God. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. God has called us to live happily ever after with him. Yes, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. The Through his words of sacrament and promise, through our very baptismal drowning and rebirth, we already have been called by him through faith. We already now live in the happily ever after with him as we wait the yet to come. The final fulfillment of his words, the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We, like John Newton and even the Apostle Peter, may be a people who have totally wasted our lives away. But by the amazing grace of God in Christ, we have been shielded cared for, and guarded as a precious child of God, because God has called us to live happily ever after with him. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we continue with our tithes and offering in our worship of God, we will do so while we sing the Magnificat on page 248 and 249. And so we'll remain seated for the first portion, and then we get to verse 5, we will stand. <laughs>
now join together in the Lenten, the litany prayer, beginning on page 249 and continuing through 250 and 251. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For President Harrison and President Maxwell, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the Church, and for all people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For President Joe Biden, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For Belinda Allen, Lolita Alston, Ken Beerlin, Terry Blackwell, Ed and Elaine Bonds, Gary Broadhagen, Ronnie Broadhagen, Jan Chaffin, Auden Francois' nieces, Millie Glover, Kathleen Gray, Jerry Henneman, Trudy Hoyman, Brittany Jones, Eleanor Larson, Mary Mahaffey, Max, Beth McCabe, Paul and Carol McCall, Joe Merkley, Lottie Mortison, Jerry Payne, Kylie Pontine, Jessica Truyo, Truyo, Ivy Two, Bobby and Barbara Yates, and Lauren Young. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Thanks be to God. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. We pause in silent prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts would be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thus. 
may be seated as we close by singing our final hymn, hymn number 733, O oh God, our help in ages past, verses 1 through 6. Thank you. 